so many ways we can sense the world around us. Most of the time, we use our eyes, ears, even our sense of smell to gather information. But what happens when the information we need is too far away to sense directly? It turns out that engineers have developed remote sensing technologies that can help us learn about things that would otherwise be far beyond our reach. To learn more about remote sensing technologies, I traveled to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, in Pasadena, California, where scientists and engineers focus their research on the robotic exploration of the solar system. I met up with Tracy Drain and Ingrid Daubar to see how they collect information about other planets that are millions of miles away from the Earth. I'm Ingrid Daubar. I'm a scientist here at JPL, and um, I study all the data that we can possibly get about all the planets in our solar system, trying to understand where the planets came from and, um, and ultimately where we all came from. I'm Tracy Drain. I'm a flight systems engineer here at the lab, and my job is to work on spacecraft and instruments and help scientists like Ingrid get their instruments where they need to go to get all the data back so they can learn about our solar system. I've heard that you use something called remote sensing technologies to learn more about the solar system. What is remote sensing? Ideally, we'd be able to send people to every planet in the solar system, but that's really hard to do. It takes a lot of time and money, and it's not very safe right now. So instead, we try to gather as much data as we can um, remotely, which means at a distance. Um, so we try to figure out um, what things are made of and what shape they are without being able to touch them. Are remote sensing technologies used here on Earth? Yeah, um, a good example is if you've ever had like an x-ray or a CAT scan at a doctor's office, that's a way that they can figure out what's inside your body without actually cutting you open. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Another example is say you're going into a grocery store and you get close to the door and magically they open. <laughs> but that's because they have a sensor that can sense that someone's walking by and so it opens the doors for you. Can you tell me a little bit about a mission that's using remote sensing technologies to learn more about Mars? Let's talk about the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MRO. This is a spacecraft that was launched in 2005, and it's been orbiting and studying the red planet since 2006. One of the instruments on MRO is HiRISE, which is a high-resolution camera. Um, it's a really special camera. It images Mars in very high resolution, which means really close up pictures of very small areas on Mars. Um, so it takes images of geologic features that are just, you know, a few meters across. Um, so if there was a car on the surface of Mars, there isn't, but if there was, <laughs> um, we would be able to take pictures of it. There is kind of a car, but not really. There's the Mars Exploration Rovers, which are there. I actually have a picture on my living room wall that has the big, beautiful Victoria Crater, and you could see that there's one of the MER rovers sitting next to it. It's kind of fuzzy, but you could tell that's what it is. You could even see the shadow from its camera mass and the tracks leading up to the crater and how it was exploring the edge. So how does the high-rise camera work? So sunlight bounces off the surface of Mars and into the high-rise camera. And then the light really bounces around inside of high-rise between a bunch of different mirrors. And then finally, it hits sensors, special sensors in the back of the camera um, that are a lot like the sensors in your digital camera. And then that data gets transferred over to the spacecraft, which transmits it all the way back to Earth. Tracy and Ingrid told me that engineers often combine remote sensing technologies with other technologies, so they can use multiple tools to get different types of information. The spacecraft before Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter had a remote sensing technology called LIDAR, Light Detection and Ranging. That allows you to generate kind of a 3D image of the surface. You can see where the mountains and valleys are, which lets us create a whole topographical map. So how does LIDAR work? So a LIDAR will send a pulse of a laser down to the ground, which will bounce and then come back. And it travels at the speed of light. And since we know how fast light travels, we can measure that, and the time it takes will let us calculate how far it is between the instrument and the ground. And then you do that multiple places around the planet, and you can put those together into a map that gives you the shape of the surface below you. So it's kind of like those pin screens where each of the laser pulses is one little pin, and it tells you whether you're on a mountain or in a valley, and that tells us a lot about the geology of Mars. So we take all of these thousands and thousands of LiDAR pings and we map them out over the whole surface of Mars to get a topographic map of the whole globe. Oh, why don't we take a look at this? Yeah, so Yay. this is a whole map of Mars using the LiDAR remote sensing technology. Um, and it show, what it shows us is the high areas and the low areas on Mars. So this is Olympus Mons, the biggest volcano mm -hmm. in the solar system. And that's not snow on top of it. No, that's not snow. <laughs> um, instead, what it is is the color scale on this map shows us the elevation of that surface. So the white is the highest areas, and the blue is an ocean. Mm -hmm. It's actually the lowest areas. 
Another cool thing we can see from the LiDAR data is uh, these valleys here, we can tell from the shape of them and the depth um, that liquid water once flowed across the surface of Mars to form these river valleys. Very cool. So why don't we go explore some other areas of JPL where we did some of this design process. Great, yeah. let's go. Let's go. I went to the High Bay One clean room where new remote sensing technologies are being built. We had to cover our whole bodies in special suits in order to get up close to the sensitive equipment. Even a tiny hair or flake of skin could affect the way these technologies function in space. Unlike the replicas that Tracy and Ingrid showed me earlier, the technologies that are being engineered in this room will actually be launched into space. I asked Tracy and Ingrid about how these complicated technologies were developed. They told me about a tool called the engineering design process, which is a series of steps that engineers use to solve problems. First, they identify a place in the solar system they'd like to learn more about, but is hard to get to. Next, they investigate how other engineers have approached similar problems in the past. After that, they use their creativity to imagine possible solutions. I decided I wanted to learn more about this process, so I asked Tracy and Ingrid to show me where a lot of the designing takes place. This room is called Left Field, and it is a place where scientists and engineers can come together to kind of brainstorm things about a, a problem that they have identified. They kind of want to use their creativity and imagination in order to come up with lots of possible solutions to the thing that they're working on. And Left Field is a really good name for it because sometimes these ideas that come out of nowhere or sound really crazy the first time you hear them turn out to be the best solution to a problem. That's right. And so when you're in that brainstorming session, you might write a bunch of things down, throw them up on the wall, on sticky notes and really try not to be too negative and toss out ideas before you've just gotten everything out. And then, once you start thinking more realistically about your requirements and constraints, you might trim off some things that aren't going to work and then focus in on the ones that have some real promise. So what's the difference between scientists and engineers? So a scientist like me is trying to understand how the world works, and we have a lot of big picture questions about the universe and about Mars specifically, um, but we need the engineers to kind of help us figure out the best way to answer a lot of those questions. That's right, because engineers like me, we really use science that you already understand, physics about the world, in order to develop specific technologies that are used by the scientists to gather their data in order to learn what they want to learn about the world. What happens if you have an idea, but it doesn't work out the way you thought it would? That's actually totally okay, because in here, we like to come up with a lot of ideas that are kind of pushing the limits, and we know not all of them are going to work. When you have ideas that fail, you actually learn a lot from them. So this becomes, this is kind of a safe environment where it's okay to have ideas that fail. And we'd much rather fail during testing than fail at Mars. Ingrid and Tracy plan the designs for the remote sensing technologies by writing down their ideas and discussing how they will work. After they create their designs in the clean room, they put their technologies through rigorous tests that simulate the effects of flying through space. Then, they take the knowledge gained from those tests to improve their designs and communicate those results out to others. But the engineering design process is never really finished. Engineers at JPL work through these steps over and over in order to design technologies that can function in the harshest conditions of outer space. So what might future remote sensing technologies be able to detect? One of the big questions that scientists have is whether there's life as elsewhere in the universe, um, either on another planet in our solar system or even on planets around other stars. So right now we can use light waves to figure out you know, what minerals are on the surface of Mars, but maybe there's some other way that we haven't invented yet to figure out whether there's actually life there on those other planets. And it'll be really interesting for us as engineers to work with the scientists to figure out what some of these new technologies might be, and we could really use bright young minds coming out of school to come and help us attack this problem. It's been amazing learning about how scientists and engineers work together to create remote sensing technologies. The universe is a big place, and we still have a lot to learn. It'll be up to you to create new remote sensing technologies that can help us look further than we ever have before.